Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, a physiologically relevant 3D ECM for in vitro oncology research and intelligent high content imaging of 3D models. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Molecular Devices. To learn more, visit them at moleculardevices.com. Now, we encourage you today to participate by submitting any questions you may have during this presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues you might have if you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation. I'd now like to welcome our speakers today, Alodi Vandenhot, a project leader in pharmacology at HCS Pharma, and Guillaume Fruget, a senior imaging application scientist at Molecular Devices. Alodi and Guillaume, welcome to both of you. You may now begin your presentation. Thank you, Susie, for the nice introduction, and hello, everyone. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me okay. Um, so my name is Guillaume Prugier. I work for uh, Molecular Devices as an application scientist for, for imaging. And uh, before Elodie presents her work um, at HCS Pharma, I'm going to present a few aspects of molecular devices, imaging, hardware, and software, along with a couple of ex examples. So we are a provider of instrumentation. Uh, and in, right here, I'm going to speak about imaging technology. So um, in, ter oh, sorry, in terms of uh, um, Microscopy and imaging, um, well, we all know what microscopy is about. Uh, mostly it's about capturing a sample uh, with minimal uh, disruption to the sample itself in various uh, aspects, fluorophores, etc. Uh, but the difference between, uh, let's just say, normal microscopy and automated imaging is that the, um, uh, the, uh, the end product of automated imaging is not so much the image itself, which can see on the left and then different examples of this in the middle. The end products of such technologies are what you can see on the right. It's about capturing population data. It's about capturing statistically significant uh, information. The challenge uh, that we can, we can uh, see uh, as, as manufacturers is the wide array of applications that people wish to run on, on those types of platforms, uh, a variety of, of, of samples from the simplest monocellular uh, Examples of yeast to uh, multicellular organisms, such as zebrafish or C. elegans, for instance, and in between everything in 2D and 3D. With the added uh, holy trinity of, of what a, uh, a solution should be uh, bringing, I, I, which is flexibility, simplicity, and, and, and speed all in one in the same package. And to try and tackle the needs from the different customers that we meet out in the field, Molecular Devices um, has a, a wide array of, of imaging capabilities from the simplest of, um, of images, one of them being called the, the Pico on the bottom right here, to the high-end uh, micro confocal uh, HTAI on the top left. And uh, the, the aim of today, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is mostly to, to speak about the, the high-end bit, uh, which is going to be relevant to what LOD is going to show. Uh, which is a microconfocal HTAI, which HTAI that has different uh, characteristics from a, a hardware and software standpoint, which I, I wish to, to speak about. So uh, this is a, a confocal instrument. Uh, and uh, beyond this, it, it can uh, bring different types of what are called disk geometries. So you have a disk star, different size, different shape, uh, different spacing of, of pinhole pipes, and what that brings is a great flexibility in terms of uh, how you want to adapt the performance of the instrument to the type of assay that you wish to run. Not every day you need to use confocal or high resolution confocal, so maybe you just want to use it as a simple white field, but maybe at some point you'll be able to use, uh, you, you want to use a, a high resolution confocal disk, and this is available to users through a simple drop down menu into the, into the software that will allow them to choose between a given disk or another one, and therefore tailor the performance of the machine to what they wish to achieve. We are continuously developing the offering, so we have, have two new uh, uh, geometries that have been recently released that are mostly um, directed towards 3D imaging, tissue imaging. Another feature that, that can be relevant is the type of light source. Uh, 
most recent uh, versions of these instruments bring uh, high power eight channel light sources. And but when I say high power, uh, they are uh, between two and six times more powerful than uh, the, the previous generation of instrumentation that, uh, that we propose. So obviously using uh, laser light sources of that nature will bring increased signal to noise uh, compared to an LED illumination, for instance, will allow you to detect uh, signals with, uh, the, sorry, samples of low signal uh, and, and, and increased data accuracy. Just looking at the com a very quick comparison uh, between laser illumination and LED illumination, what that means in practical terms as well is a two-fold acquisition speed increase uh, with up to 75% lower exposure times compared to an LED illumination. You'll have sharper images and also a, a wider flexibility with, with eight channel allowing for uh, multiplexing. Another very important aspect of those machines are, for instance, the, uh, the, the possibility to use different types of objectives. So you have dry objectives, obviously going from 1x to 100x, but ultimately you also have uh, immersion objectives, water immersion objectives, and that has an impact um, not only, as we all understand, when it comes to uh, reducing phototoxicity and, and exposure times and increasing uh, resolution because of higher numerical aperture, but it has also another importance uh, which, which is further uh, described here, which is that because you're keeping the same kind of refractive index, a white a water based sample and, and what is essentially a, uh, a, 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 the, the, the immersion medium as well from the objective, then you, you have an improved ellipticity uh, of your sample compared to uh, dry objectives or air objectives that would lead to uh, much more disruption as to in terms of image quality. Um, just looking out uh, more uh, broadly, broadly speaking, um, there are more um, um, hardware options that exist on, on the Image Express uh, microcon focal. Obviously, you, you can have translated light options allowing you to do uh, phase contrast imaging. You have um, light cell controls with food, CO2, temperature, and humidity if you want to keep your cells alive for a longer period of time. Uh, you have a fluidics module to do compound addition and medium exchange. Um, and what we call advanced workflow and engineering solutions uh, that, uh, to an extent, deal with uh, everything uh, regarding automation, but also customization uh, of, of instruments. So we can provide solutions that would meet the particular needs of a customer if the standard offering doesn't meet those needs. But I'll come back to some aspects of this a little bit later. Just looking at, at a very simple, basic, um, uh, workflow for cell culture and, and compound addition in 3D space. What you can see on the slide here is, is something that is uh, quite simple, quite straightforward. Uh, the, the simplest way to basically form uh, things like uh, organoids or, or steroids is to have them uh, grow or sediment into a, a round bottom plate. So th such plates are uh, very easy to, uh, to image. And what you can see on the, on the top right is for instance, on the instrument, um, the instrument that has acquired the entirety of a 384 well plate, plate and it's showing to you a montage of all the thumbnails of all the images that were acquired in one go. So already at that stage, you can see the different trends in your plate um, with the different uh, uh, sizes of, uh, of steroids, for instance, if you're treating them with, with cancer drugs, um, and the number of cells in the steroids, the quantity of live cells versus dead cells, which is something that you can quite easily uh, analyze. But not all the, the situations are, are that easy. Uh, very often, uh, you don't have a situation whereby um, you only have a single spheroid uh, uh, well. What you very frequently end up having is a, a situation where you have different objects that are unevenly spaced across uh, the well at different uh, heights, different focus levels, different positions in the well. And uh, in order to capture them selectively, uh, we, uh, we propose a solution that's called Quick ID that is essentially decomposed in, a, in two steps. The first step is, is the acquisition in low magnification of uh, the entirety of the, um, of the plate, uh, and then a quick analysis that will that is that, that is customizable by the by the user will detect uh, specifically the objects of interest of that particular user, and then. Um, the coordinates of the objects of interest will be uh, recorded by the instrument, and the second round of acquisition will only uh, focus on the objects of interest whose coordinates were saved previously. 
And that saves a lot of time in terms of imaging time compared to having to acquire everything at a higher magnification to start with to capture all the events. That saves a lot of, a lot of images uh, to store and it's also less time to, to analyze. So when you're looking at a slide such as, such as this one and, and the one that, that, that follows here, basically what this uh, is, is summarizing is the fact that in the first round of acquisition on the plate, uh, an instrument was able to automatically detect a number of airway organoids uh, for well, and then um, we'll be able to automatically come back to those positions of interest only, then acquire them with, in that case, a 40 x water immersion, acquire them in 3D uh, with a custom number of depth planes, a custom, num uh, custom interval, and the custom um, or user-defined rather confocal disk uh, with a laser light source to only uh, capture uh, in greater detail those objects of interest. And obviously, I spoke about the, uh, the quantification. So image capture is interesting, but so the uh, image stress micro confocal kind of still comes with two uh, uh, separate types of, of package. One of them is called Meta Express that drives the instrument, but also uh, will provide a, a set of toolbox uh, interfaces to provide some, let's just say, classical segmentation techniques. Uh, that would be uh, very uh, open in, in what they allow to do to the user. So in this instance. Here, what is being shown is just a, a small recording of the interface where uh, the user was able to, uh, to uh, uh, quantify in 3D the airway organoid that previously showed, where you have a, a quantification of the different cell types, their position in the organoids, different uh, intensities, etc., that you will find um, uh, of all those different objects in the airway organoid. And such an interface can be used in 2D, in 3D, of, on data that was acquired through time. Um, and it can also um, deal with uh, other things than, than, uh, than organoids, but also simple uh, monolayer cells. But the other software that was recently uh, incorporated and added into, into Meta Express as well is called Incarta. And that software is a little bit different and it brings an added set of tools that are um, uh, articulated around machine learning techniques, uh, either advanced uh, quantification or deep neural networks. It provides uh, um, um, sorry, customized segmentation of complex objects. And additionally, it also provides with um, uh, the user with uh, advanced 3D volumetric uh, calculation and, and visualization. Going back to this, to this slide I showed earlier about the, uh, micro, uh, the micro confocal uh, HTAI, um, this instrument, as I said, comes with a number of features, and, and uh, one of them is also the ability to be uh, customized and also integrated. And before I hand it over to, uh, to, to Elodie for her talk, two final slides. One of them shows uh, these two slides here are essentially come from the initial design of the, the automation platform that Molecular Devices provided HCS Pharma with uh, that uh, dealt with a number of different steps, one of them being the uh, uh, the, the uh, platform being designed and represented in, in, in virtual reality, which is what you can see here, and the entire conception uh, and installation and uh, factory acceptance test, site acceptance test, and, and, and biological method development was done in collaboration with HCS Farm. Finish, I would like to thank you for your time. And uh, if you have uh, uh, five minutes between the two webinars and you want to see more, uh, don't hesitate to hop on our website. Um, in the resources section, you'll be able to find a number of videos and webinars that are uh, pre-recorded and available on demand. Uh, and most prominently, a, a recent uh, imaging workshop that was held in mid-March uh, where HCS Pharma figured and, and presented their data as well. And with this, I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Elodie. So Elodie, I think you need to take control and the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. I will take on so thanks for the introduction. And uh, of course, thanks to uh, Labout and Molecular Devices uh, to, uh, to, uh, to organize this, uh, this webinar. Um, I am uh, Elodie, so I'm working in, uh, in HS Pharma Company uh, as a project leader in pharmacology. And uh, I will going to, I'm going to present you today the, our work on the biominesis. Uh, relevant uh, 3D extracellular matrix uh, hydroscaffold for uh, in vitro research in uh, oncology. 
First, a few words uh, about HCS Pharma Company. Uh, it was founded in 2014. It counts 13 employees. Our offices and labs are in Los, um, near Eura Santé Bio Business Park in Lille, in France. And historically, we are providing services uh, for the, the, the study of safety and efficacy uh, of, of compounds, of ingredients or molecules in, uh, in HCA, so high content analysis and high content screening, using 2D and 3D cell culture systems. Our customers come from the cosmetic, pharmaceutical, and nutraceutical industries. And our company and our president, Nathalie Maubon, has, uh, has, have won uh, some awards. In particular, last year, we were uh, selected as the Deep Tech Pioneer by a Hello Tomorrow Global Summit. So Biomimesis uh, is a 3D cell culture system. We acquired the, the patent because uh, it is an innovative in vivo mimicking 3D cell culture technology. So we are now concentrating all our efforts to create a full range of, uh, of biomimesis products to answer uh, drug discovery needs, uh, research needs in general for various organs and therapeutic areas, including, uh, of course, oncology, because uh, this is the subject of, uh, of today's webinar. So our facilities um, comprise cell culture labs and the chemistry lab for the R&D and manufacturing of, uh, of biomimesis uh, products. We own cell handling and automated imaging devices. So we have one Image Express Micro XLS uh, for molecular devices in standalone. We also have uh, two uh, liquid handler systems in standalone and uh, two Image Express Microconfocal imaging systems on our platform called Apix, uh, which you can see on this picture and also on the one that was presented by Guillaume earlier. Uh, knowing that uh, effectively the platform was uh, was integrated by uh, molecular devices, and if you're interested in this, you you could uh, you could see uh, the, this platform in uh, So nowadays, still many models are being uh, being done in 2D cell cultures with uh, monolayers of cells grown on plastic, and we we know that human tissues in vivo are in 3D. And um, with cells being embedded in a physiological uh, extracellular matrix with adhesion proteins and solid scaffold behaviors around them. And with biomimesis, we, we know that we can embed these cells in a physiological matrix, an ECM line matrix, uh, including a solid scaffold part and adhesion proteins as well. So we need to reproduce, and there is need in, in, uh, in the pharmaceutical industries and in, uh, in, uh, in academic laboratories anyway, to reproduce the in vivo situation using 3D cell culture system with more relevant micro environments, a more relevant uh, ECM, to develop more predictive in vitro cellular models. The extracellular matrix is uh, of great importance in the biology of, uh, of tissues and cells, of course, uh, because it is important in cell anchorage and migration. It is also involved in cell-cell communication, uh, since it is a reservoir for, for signaling, for signaling molecules like cytokines and growth factors. The matrix interacts directly with the cells through uh, receptors. And uh, there is a high impact of the matrix on the cell behavior in general, uh, in terms of differentiation, proliferation, because it, the, the biomechanical force uh, of the ECM impacted the cell behavior. And also the cell itself uh, impacted the matrix because it can produce, for example, uh, proteinases that will impact uh, its uh, structure and composition. The composition of the ECM is uh, different from one organ or from one tissue to another, but still there are common uh, components like structural elements, glycosaminoglycans, among them hyaluronic acid, but also proteoglycan. There are also structural proteins, uh, collagens, elastin also, and last but not least, adhesion proteins like fibronectin and laminin that are um, uh, important for the adhesion of the cells uh, to, to the matrix.
The matrix is, um, is also characterized by its uh, stiffness, and there is uh, in, uh, in vivo a large range of uh, different stiffnesses uh, as measured by, uh, by the measure of elastic modulus. Uh, that I will I will uh, I will uh, talk to you about also a bit later. Um, for example, when we grow cells on plastic, we are growing them on uh, on a substrate that is even more uh, st that is stiffer than the bone, and uh, it makes sense then to consider the cells in a physiological matrix that can reproduce uh, different stiffnesses. Importantly. Um, the matrix stiffness and also composition can be changed in pathology, in pathologies like fibrosis and cancer. So uh, in our mind, it's also uh, really important to check for, for both features, uh, composition and the stiffness uh, when, when talking about, about different pathologies. So the stiffness is critical to generate the adequate ECM impact on cells and to obtain representative cell responses. And unlike other 3D circuitry systems, biomimesis matrix, stiffness and composition can be adjusted over a large range to mimic the, the cellular microenvironment of any organ or tissue, uh, either uh, healthy or pathological, for example, fibrotic. So hyaluronic acid is uh, a major component of the extracellular matrix. It impacts uh, the, the structure of the tissue because it's important in water uh, absorption. It binds to growth factors and proteoglycans, so it has a biological uh, impact. And the cell matrix interactions are also at stake. Uh, I mean, there are some uh, hyaluronic acid receptors at the surface of the cell that can, uh, in fact, impact uh, biological, biologically the cells and uh, and uh, and finally, the, the cells will be, uh, will be um, impacted by, by the hyaluronic acid in, in its environment. That is uh, to say biomimesis is uh, at the base of, uh, of biomimesis products. So it is a hyaluronic acid-based 3D culture system. It contains uh, hyaluronic acid and also other proteins like collagen and or adhesion proteins or peptides. All of these are uh, cross-linked so using a peptide-based cross-linker called ADH. If you um, cross-link these components, you get a hydrogel, but this one is unadapted to cell culture because it degrades quickly. So uh, it is thanks to a patented process that you can make uh, all these uh, components uh, create uh, stable hydroscaffold, hydroscaffold, meaning we get in the end an interpenetrated network of hyaluronic acid and collagen with a, uh, a, an elastic modulus so stiffness between 100 and 15 kilopascal and a porosity uh, between 100 and 200 micrometers. So is made of native ECM components, hyaluronic acid, and structural proteins and also uh, adhesion proteins or peptides. And the related process makes this matrix stable a long time. Can you hear me? Um, uh, yes. We're having another little bit of trouble hearing you again. Uh, I'm sorry, I see no problem. There we go. You're at, good at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Right. So the relative yeah. surface makes uh, makes this matrix stable a long time. So with a stiffness and a composition that can be uh, adjusted to mimic organ or disease microenvironment. So I will move to the next slide. So that's why we call bioimages a hydroscaffold. It is the only 3D culture system with a dual uh, behavior. Here you see the dehydrated matrix because it comes geophilized. Um, um, it is not only a hydrogel and not only a, a solid scaffold. And when we rehydrate the matrix, I will show you uh, a picture. You have both the solid scaffold behavior with the fibers that you can see here 
on the bright field um, picture. And also the hydrogen behavior that is important for swelling and uh, cell adhesion. So this makes biomimesis a unique uh, hydro scaffold with a dual hydro gel and solid scaffold behavior, uh, as in fact uh, the one you could expect from, uh, from the native uh, extracellular matrix. How does it look like under uh, scanning electron microscopy? Biomimesis is on, on the left, so you can see a whole matrix here. You see it is porous. In fact, the cell can easily diffuse within. And when looking at the scanning electron microscopy more in detail, you can see the hyaluronic acid sheets here in gray, and in brown, the interpenetrated uh, collagen fibers. On the right, you see how it looks for the cellularized tissue, and you can see the close, um, how close is biomimesis in terms of ultrastructure. So biomimesis is porous. It mimics uh, the in vivo extracellular matrix. And uh, dealing with cancer research, we know that the matrix is modified. I mean, the problem is that at the moment, uh, the, ma the models do not reproduce the in vivo tumoral microenvironment, in particular the SEM, because we know in healthy tissue, uh, the cells are embedded in the healthy ECM, and some changes impact uh, the, this ECM around the cells and making the tissue fibrotic or desmoplastic, as it can be said in, uh, in oncology field. And there is a related ECM related stress on the cells. Then this tissue changes, induce changes again on the cells, uh, may, I mean, inducing proliferation uh, or a migration of the cells, making the cells uh, more cancerous and the tissue um, uh, or metastasis uh, behavior of the cells. So the problem is, um, is that if you do not model uh, this in your in vitro model, you might also lose some information related to the ECM changes. So to properly reproduce cancer pathophysiology, the cancerous ECM should be taken into account, so composition and stiffness, in addition to the cells. That's, uh, we have different cell culture products. Uh, as I said, they have different composition and stiffnesses depending on the, um, on the, on the organ or the pathology. And we have uh, developed a generic matrix called Biomimesis Oncology, the generic one, in which uh, there is uh, hyaluronic acid and collagen one, an enriched uh, composition in, uh, in collagen one, and an elastic modulus of one kilopascal. So why have we uh, enriched this matrix with collagen one? It's because uh, many cancers are um, in fact um, shown to be um, fibrotic, cancer tissues are fibrotic, with a high content in collagen 1. I will give you examples of cancer cell cultures and results that have been obtained in biomimesis oncology. And I will uh, show you a couple of results and pictures about uh, colon cancer, but also breast cancer later on. I will begin with uh, HT29 colon cancer cell lines in biomimesis. Uh, as seen from the scanning electron microscopy uh, pictures, you see the growing cell here in, within uh, the matrix. So you can see even interactions between the matrix and the, and the cell uh, themselves here. So colon cancer cells invade the matrix as, uh, as growing cell And by mimesis allowing uh, to do life cell staining, but also uh, other uh, immunocytochemistry uh, or other techniques, you can see uh, easily the, the spheroids on the uh, right, left picture, sorry, you see the matrix here between the spheroids and the spheroids over here. On the right, um, you are able to, to observe a live dead um, staining of the cells. The all nuclei are in blue, the live cells are in green, and the dead cells are in red. So biomimesis allows life cell staining, a related image analysis, allowing to check, for example, uh, the anti-cancer drug efficacy of, uh, of drugs. And this was done uh, with, with, uh, with colon cancer cells. Uh, here is the example of a 5 euro uracil uh, anti-cancer drug efficacy to kill uh, the cells in vitro. 
thanks to like that essay, we compared the two culture by mimesis, oncology responses, and in vivo uh, responses. You see the, with the 3D culture that we have a low EC50 value. Here is the EC50 curve in, in red. And here in, gray, in green is the extrapolated in vivo curve that we can expect for, for this compound. In fact, there is a huge gap between 2D cell culture and in vivo responses. With biomimesis oncology, we kind of fill the gap uh, between, uh, between um, in vivo and the in vitro models. So we are much more close uh, to, uh, we are closer to the in vivo responses in terms of uh, EC50 uh, values and EC50 curve. So this is an example um, showing that uh, biomimesis can offer a better correlation with in vivo data regarding anti-cancer drug uh, efficacy. Interestingly, uh, biomimesis allows the long-term culture of, of cancer cells. Here is again an, an example of, um, of a colon cancer cell line. Here is ACT116 uh, cells from day three to day 28 in the biomimesis oncology matrix. So the lifestyle, calcine, positive cell are in, in, uh, in, uh, in green, and below uh, all nuclei are in, uh, in, uh, in blue. You see that we can really invade the matrix. So you have spherids at the beginning, but then you can even get bigger structures um, in the matrix. Also showing that the cells are alive for all this, uh, all this time. It allows therefore long-term culture, and something we are uh, currently working on is the, uh, is the use of such long-term models. So we know that we can even go uh, much further than just 28 days. But interestingly, with such models, we can, we can do chronic treatments, repeated dose treatments, which is, uh, of course, interesting in terms of, uh, of relevance uh, dealing with oncology uh, treatment, meaning not only an acute treatment, but, uh, but regular treatment. Another aspect of uh, cancer research is also the, the use of co-cultures. Not only the cancer cells are important in cancer pathophysiology, there are also stromal cells or immune cells that uh, can impact. We know that we can do co-cultures in biomimesis uh, with uh, fibro fibroblasts, cancer-associated fibroblasts, for example. And here is a, uh, are some pictures of, uh, of the colon cancer cells in co-culture with primary human macrophages uh, in biomimesis oncology. So we know that we can do such co-cultures, we can perform such co-cultures. Uh, either uh, both cell types, uh, different cell types can be seeded at the same time, or sequentially, so meaning first the cancer cells and then afterwards the immune cells or other cells, which give uh, interesting um, uh, features for anti-cancer drug uh, testing uh, in different settings. So biomimesis allows the use of co-cultures in, uh, in oncology. And um, as I said from the beginning, we can play uh, with biomimesis, we can tune biomimesis composi composition and, and stiffness. And this is what we have done, uh, but this time in the frame of, uh, of breast cancer. We have checked uh, how the modification of the ECM can impact the growth of uh, breast cancer cells. Yes, okay. Uh, so as I said, we, we, ta we, we have taken uh, biomimesis oncology as the basis, and um, we, we changed uh, its, uh, its stiffness, so we increased a lot. So from one kilopascal, we obtained a 10 kilopascal matrix. And in this case, we increased a lot the, uh, the proliferation of, the, of breast cancer cells. If we increase this uh, stiffness to 10 kilopascal, but adding uh, adhesion protein laminin in, in the mix, then we decreased, uh, on the contrary, the proliferation. So given that biomimesis composition and stiffness can be modified, we can easily uh, check for the impact of any aspect of, uh, of the matrix on the breast cancer cells or other cell types uh, to, in fact, uh, go more in the mechanism of, um, of a risk of cancer uh, pathophysiology. And we can conclude on the effect of one uh, compound or, or another uh, in the ECM.
In, uh, in the frame of uh, cancer pathophysiology, there are lots of protein-protein uh, interactions. And what can be interesting uh, is to, uh, to check such interactions using different techniques. I will uh, give you the example today of proximity ligation assay, PLA, in biomimesis. So the principle of biomimesis of uh, PLA um, is, to, uh, is to incubate the samples with, uh, with primary antibodies and uh, uh, PLA props. Uh, in fact, just, uh, for example, antibodies that are linked to oligonucleotides here, a plus and a minus one. And if the two props are close to each other, like around 30 nanometers, which suggests that there is proof that there is an interaction between the two proteins, um, then there is an hybridization step with a connector oligomers to complete a DNA circle. And this DNA circle serves as a rolling circle amplification to amplify, uh, in fact, the, the signal. And then there is hybridization of fluorescently labeled oligonucleotides for signal detection. So each time you have a spot, you can say that there is an interaction between uh, two proteins. The picture on the right shows you uh, all uh, interactions between two uh, individual proteins. So I cannot give you the names of them because it is an ongoing study with uh, our collaborators in MDA MP231 cells in biomimesis. Um, so showing that you can uh, easily check such interactions um, even in, in this in the in this uh, 3D cycle system. Uh, for this, we would like to thank uh, our collaborator from Concolil uh, Institute and in particular Canter Laboratories. So Xiofen Le Bouris, Robert Anatoyon, and Julien Cicero, uh, who, um, who, uh, who let us present today uh, this this great picture. Last but not least, um, so from the beginning, I have shown you many results in biomimesis, uh, in biomimesis matrix in plates, meaning in static uh, condition. But we have also uh, performed tests in a dynamic condition, meaning in a biochips. Here is a, a, an experiment that was performed in, in EBD or in EBD slides thanks to our collaboration with uh, Anthony Trisebré from, from IEMN, showing the, the cultures of MCF7, another uh, breast cancer cell line, but more with an epithelial phenotype, and MDAMP231 uh, cells with a more mesenchymal uh, phenotype in, uh, in, in matrix, but uh, that was done in, uh, in the biochips. Biomimesis can be... Uh, can be uh, can be advantageously used in, uh, in biochips. And you can see that uh, the cells after seven days of culture and the flow were alive. And they, show, they have shown different structures, uh, so more like steroids for MCF7 and uh, like clusters for MDMB231, but less organized. In fact, we are reproducing uh, what can be expect, expected from such, uh, from such cell lines um, in the frame, uh, or, I mean, depending on their features and their phenotype um, in, uh, in breast cancer. Uh, we have tested uh, longer time points. So as I said, here is seven days, but we have, uh, we have kept them for uh, at least 28 days in, in the conditions with still the matrix uh, that can be seen uh, at the end. So we are currently investigating um, um, the phenotype of the cell uh, after a longer uh, longer time point of cultures, and uh, it also allows the, um, the study of uh, specific markers like CAI 67, uh, showing specifically the cells that are um, in uh, in uh, in proliferation. We could observe also the cytoskeleton of of the cells uh, with actin staining and the expression of the hyaluronic acid receptor CD44 uh, a long time, which is uh, one of the different hyaluronic acid receptors that has an important role in, in breast cancer um, development. So there are different, again, um, behaviors of the cell lines in, uh, in the matrix and also different uh, um, proliferation uh, stages of the cells. Well, this could be quantified uh, using MetaExpress software at the end of the culture. 
and this is something we are we are working on at the moment uh, on the on the features and the behavior of the consistors on long term. I will finish with this other application of biomimesis, uh, namely in vivo grafting, even if this is something uh, uh, we are not uh, working on at the moment in, in HTS Pharma, but we know that uh, biomimesis can be uh, advantageously used in, uh, in in vivo studies. It was done, uh, this experiment was performed with uh, HCT 116 cells in biomimesis uh, compared to, uh, to um, to grafting uh, in in mice, and the success of uh, of the of the implantation was uh, was really great. It was 100 percent compared to 63 percent, and with uh, less cells from uh, the beginning of the experiment. On the right, you have an idea of how the the, ma the matrix and the cells were well integrated in the host tissues. Uh, you can see the transition here, uh, the good proliferation of the cells, and uh, apart from the great um, uh, implantation success. I have shown many pictures of microscopy today, but biomimesis uh, can be uh, used uh, and is compatible with many uh, downstream analytical technologies. It is um, it can be used for classical uh, spectroscopic plate reader, um, uh, yes, red, highly porous, so you can um, easily uh, take the, the lysates of the cells to make PCRs or Western blots and also ELISAs. The matrix is biodegradable, so you can finally get the cells um, after having degraded the, the matrix uh, for flow cytometry, so you can get lifestyle after your culture. And because it is solid, it is compatible with histological techniques. And as I said just in the last slide, in vivo, in vivo grafting. So biomimesis is compatible with main downstream analytical technologies. So there is no need to change uh, your workflow. Uh, here are the different products that uh, we are uh, selling for biomimesis uh, in different formats, 96 well plates, but also 384 well plates uh, for, for screening. And as explained earlier, we can customize ma the, the biomimesis matrix for your uh, specific um, applications, meaning specific composition of stiffness, if you need a specific component in, in the matrix or a specific elastic modul modulus, and in different specific uh, vessel formats, and even specific uh, fillings uh, of uh, different types of plates if, uh, if necessary. Last but not least, uh, biomimesis can also be uh, used in biochips, as uh, I have shown you before. Um, I will finish uh, with this slide. Uh, so biomimesis is the unique hydroscaffold for producing the extracellular matrix. This is the only system that can reproduce the stiffness naturally observed in the various healthy or pathological tissues or organs. Uh, because it is, it can be done really on, with a really high range um, of, of elastic uh, modulus values. So, in terms of pathological tissues or organs, we we, we think about cancer, but also uh, all the fibrotic uh, tissues. Biomimesis is a long-term matrix that provides anchor to to the cancer cells for allowing uh, chronic treatments, so possibly repeated dose treatments. And biomimesis is composed of purified, well-controlled components, allowing batch-to-batch -batch consistency. It is suitable for various agriculture vessels and is compatible uh, with uh, high-content screening platforms and um, HCS microscope as, uh, as the one um, that we are using uh, from molecular devices, of course. So biomimesis fills the gap between 3D agriculture system and in vivo uh, for higher predictability of uh, cancer models by reproducing uh, the extracellular matrix. I uh, would like to thank all my colleagues um, with whom I am working on biomimesis and our collaborators uh, who are using uh, the matrix and uh, provided us with, with some results today. And of course, I thank you for your attention. I am now waiting uh, for your questions. Uh, please, if you have questions even after the webinar, 
uh, we would be glad to answer uh, about biomimesis with his address. And I would like to, I'm sorry for the sound problems in between. I hope you, you now hear me well and that I will be able to answer to your questions uh, in good conditions. Thank you. And thank you so much, Aladi and Guillaume, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you want to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's take a look. It looks like we already have some great questions coming in from our audience. Our first question is for you, Guillaume. Is the hardware you have shown for the HTAI also available as an upgrade if I already have an image express system? Uh, yes, so most of the, thanks for the question. The, uh, as I said, we have different types of, of hardware existing and, and we've been proposing uh, information instruments and imaging for for more than a decade now. Um, and so it has been a primary objective of ours to, as much as possible, provide new generations that can be upgraded from, uh, that can be obtained from the upgrade of, of slightly uh, older generation of instruments. And so it's the case with, uh, with an HCAI instrument. If you have a, a previously, um, previously acquired uh, micro console, then you can upgrade to an HCAI. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and Elodie, this question mm -hmm. is for you. Can the hydro scaffold be taken out of the wells? And if so, how? Uh, yes, in fact, um, in uh, maybe it was in one of my uh, slides. My slide, uh, I will just take uh, the number 29. In fact, uh, you can take out the, the matrix from the from the plate just with a pin set. In fact, uh, because contrary to hydrogel, it won't um, uh, you you cannot de de degrade it just like uh, taking it from the wells. So it's quite easy and it's quite practical if you need to move it uh, or to do something with it. Uh, so yes, it's really easy. You cannot uh, destroy it by taking it with a pin set. In fact. Thank you so much. And Elodie, can you recommend a relevant 3D in vitro model which can be used to track single cells? Um, I mean, it depends on the cells that you are using anyway, uh, because um, some of them will grow in steroids, but some other not. So I, I guess it's also uh, depending on the cells. But in biomimesis, what can be easily done is you can adjust just uh, the the density uh, of the cells from the beginning, uh, you can adjust the density uh, in uh, in the matrix, and uh, we can also play around with the with the porosity, so to decrease it, uh, and to and so therefore depending on the cell type and how it it uh, it behaves in in the matrix, we can play with different parameters to have only single cells. I hope I answered the question and that you you could hear me well. Thank you so much. Now. For both of you, could the 3D extracurricular matrix explain oncology disease clinically, especially for medical practice? Um, could the 3D extracurricular matrix explain oncology disease clinically, especially for medical practice? I'm not sure I get what is meant by medical practice, um, but um, as far as I know, since we can keep the cells for a long time, and as I said, we can do chronic treatments, repeated dose treatments, and even with uh, with biochips, uh, we have uh, in collaboration uh, again uh, observed great results in uh, pancreatic disease um, in terms of uh, of responses that were clinically relevant. Um, so, if it's in terms of responses. Uh, or long term long term studies um i would say yes if it's in terms of pathophysiology um i i would say uh, yes again uh, but 
depending on which mattress you use and which cell you use. For example, if you mean um, medical practice and the use of cancer cells from patients, I haven't put any uh, data here today, but uh, but we know that uh, that this can be done with also uh, primary cells from patients. So this is uh, also something we are we are working on in the at the moment. Thank you so much. And again, I want to thank our audience for these great questions coming in. Our next audience question is, can we grow cancer cell lines in biomimesis? In fact, yes. Um, most of the results I've shown today were done with cancer cell lines. Um, so, it, I mean, I cannot be exhaustive, but we have tested really a lot of, cell, of cancer cell lines in biomimesis uh, oncology. So, yeah, definitely, yes. Thank you so much. And our next audience member says, thank you. This is an amazing webinar, very informative. What are the difficulties that you have encountered when cult um, culturing tumor cells? Culturing. Um, so when, uh, what problem have we encountered when culturing tumor cells? I mean, I ha we have encountered more problems uh, in 2D, I think crowded wells and but um in the matrix um we can we we, we could adjust uh, really easily the 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 density of the cells and uh, um really it's really difficult for me to answer this question. Um maybe that it works uh, really great. Um so you need to adjust the density of the cells because um, you, 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 it depends on how long you need to cultivate the cells uh, because then you, you might need to change the format uh, to have enough uh, cell culture medium to feed all these uh, growing cells. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that, uh, that is something uh, you should uh, be careful about when culturing uh, cancer cells in general in 3D. Um, if they are growing well, uh, yes, you, you need to feed them really regularly or to change the format. But this is something easy again with biomimesis because you can change from one format to another. So, thank you so much. Our next question is for you, Guillaume. You mentioned other imaging platforms such as the Pico Express. If HTAI is meant for high-end 3D imaging, are those also meant for complex? 3D biology or other types of assays. So thank you. So I guess it would it would depend what you mean by by complex. So in the in the 3D space, um, certainly you can use the, the Pico. The Pico is is a much simpler instrument. It's a uh, it's a wide field uh, benchtop personal imager, uh, and in this respect, it it, it lacks the, the 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 actual resolution that a confocal machine such as the micro would bring. But it still allows you, for instance, to look at simple models such as the such as spheroids. You can follow spheroid size and intensity through time, which is fine. Uh, you can look at uh, at stru structures in 3D, but you will not get the same kind of information that you get from a from a confocal instrument. Uh, in general, uh, those machines uh, can be found uh, in labs that have nothing to do with 3D, for instance, because they will just uh, use them on, on 2D, 2D model layer cells, uh, on a wide variety of assays. Uh, in 3D space, you would find them, and, uh, in, in, for instance, in assay development, in early stages of, of, of screens uh, to do some very simple testing before you go onto the, the big machines and, and do more advanced uh, screening. So you can definitely use them in 3D space uh, with less resolution with the confocal machines. Uh, but they still bring uh, some relevant information there. Thank you so much, Guillaume. Our next question is for you, Elodie. Is there heparin sulfate in the composition of biomimesis? Thank you. Um, so in the basic, um, I mean, basal composition of biomimesis, uh, no, but um, I know that uh, we can add, for example, um, chondroidin sulfate, proteoglycan, and others, and I do not see any problem to add heparin sulfate uh, in in the model. Um, I mean, in the matrix, if if it if it if it should be done. As soon as we can find the component uh, anywhere, you, we can add it to the to the matrix. In fact, 
Thank you so much. And here's another question for you and our final question for our webinar. Odie, is there an expiration date for this product? Um, yes, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not short. So you have one year uh, expiration date, um, meaning if you, if you get the plate, you can use it uh, uh, within a year. I mean, if you keep it in the fridge and uh, um, it is sent in, uh, in sealed packages, um, yes, they, it's quite long. Uh, it's even really long for, for such a product, so one year. Uh, in the fridge and it's it's uh, it's still uh, it's still really um, in good conditions to to be used for 3D culture. Dion Elodie, thank you so much for your presentation today. Would you like to provide some closing remarks for our audience before we go? I'll start with you, Elodie. Um, yeah, I just wanted to to that it's. And actually, I'm going to move to Guillaume because we lost you again, Elodie. Guillaume, would you like to provide our audience with some closing remarks before we go? Uh, yes. Well, thank you, Susie, uh, and thank you um, for uh, your uh, uh, the organization of this webinar, and thank you for the to the audience as well. Uh, just going back to the um, uh, to one of the questions about the uh, the use of, of those models uh, in uh, in the clinical space. I guess what we showed today with ZeroDemo was mostly R&D and not necessarily that close to the clinical space. But we, um, as, as a provider, as molecular devices, we've seen uh, definitely a complexification of assays over the last few, few years, moving from 2D monolayer onto 3D space, spheroids, organoids, microfluidics, etc. Uh, as endpoint or indeed in, in, in uh, um, in, uh, in time lapse or through time, um, and this kind of complexification of uh, of assays uh, is really allowed by a, an increasing maturity of both the hardware and the software packages that are coming with instrumentation, or indeed the type of of, uh, of models and products like biomimesis that LOD proposed, and the. Um, if you combine such maturity with, with the uh, the statistical the physiological relevance of the model, the, um, the appeal, the multiplexing of microscopy techniques, uh, and uh, the statistically significant data, the population data that is provided with uh, biotomation. Uh, this makes it a great uh, uh, combination, biomimesis and automated imaging, uh, to, to provide um, data or information that are as physiologically relevant as possible within the confines of a of a, what is essentially an in vitro model, and and um, and to that respect, we know from from a variety of customers that this is used in a, in let's just say in translational medicine uh, quite increasingly uh, to 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 get insights into into cancer research uh, in particular. So. Um, if, if you want to, if you're working on a particular cellular module, and and, um, and, and if you're interested in knowing more, uh, it's always a uh, about how those technologies and techniques are, are always are used. It's a, it, you know, just turn towards PubMed or Google Scholar and have a quick uh, bio, bio um, research because you you find a lot of uh, a lot of articles, a lot of papers that have been published uh, using those technologies. Um, yes, these are my concluding remarks. Thank you, everyone, everyone for attending. Thank you. I'm sorry that uh, you lost me again, but uh... <laughs> and no worries. And thank you, Alodi Jiom, for your time today and for your important research. I'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Molecular Devices, for underwriting today's educational webcast. And before we go, I want to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions, questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand. Labroots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, Take care, everyone.
and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.